So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, teachers, students, parents. If you're watching from whichever country and whichever time zone you are at, I am here today with, oh, before that, happy Easter. I keep forgetting it's Easter. So happy Easter if you're celebrating Easter. If not, then um, enjoy your uh, long weekend, as the Australians say. Today, I have Sam Retty, and we will be looking into his wonderful program, which I have tried, and uh, it's called Musy.life, if you haven't already. Um, otherwise, we are going to show you what it's all about, and by all means, you are able to try it for free, I think, from, from memory. Okay, so let me just introduce a very quick introduction to Sam Ratti. Now, Sam is a professional guitarist, so he's not just an IT guy. Um, he actually knows what he's doing in regards to music in itself. And as a musician and an educator, uh, he understands the whole concept of teaching uh, students, be it uh, in a studio or online. So that's, that's what I love about the program is the, the program is done by someone that actually knows music. Someone actually knows the teaching side of it. So it's, it's beautiful how you have, um, how this is family owned, as you mentioned before, and how it's managed where you take full control of it. So if there's any issue, it's, it's always fixed, like almost immediately. Um, so yeah, take it away, Sam. Have I missed something? <laughs> oh, that, that's great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It should be should be fun. But yeah, it's uh, Musi is an online platform and we'll dive into it in a second. But basically it's for in-person online hybrid teaching and we're a family owned business. It's my dad and I who have been sort of running the show. And um, you know, we started it as a college project in 2016 and it just sort of kept evolving from there. And then Musi itself was launched in early 2020, uh, right before all of the, you know, everything changed. <laughs> um, so it's then, like you were prepared for it. It's like it just yeah. so happened that you were kind of moving into yeah, that yeah. area, isn't it? It was weird. Yeah, we launched on January 10th, 2020. And then like literally, it was kind of funny because it was like no signups for a week, one or two signups. And then we everybody gets like the email that's hey, lockdown's happening. And then the, <laughs> the signups just started, you know, kind of flooding in. and everyone's like, okay, online it is. So that's sort of where we kind of cut our um, bread. You know, we kind of got really good at doing online lessons. That was something that the pandemic sort of forced on everyone, obviously. Um, but Musi was in the right position at the right time to make that happen. Um, and we had technology from years before all the other stuff we'd been building was all practice software, lesson management tools, all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of that has now sort of evolved its way back into Musi. Um, and it's sort of a full-blown um, education platform for music teachers. Yeah, so so many years ago, I've had this conversation with a couple of colleagues where we were contemplating between, um, you know, moving on to the online teaching. And at that time, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be teaching online. Um, I'm already, you know, overwhelmed with all this teaching. I'm not going to learn another way of teaching online and figuring out all these gadgets. But COVID was like kind of a shock to everyone going, you too bad you gotta learn all this technology in a sense. pretty much yeah you didn't get to choose and we were in the right place at the right time and we had the right uh sets of skills and capabilities because we've been building the software for a really long time and we've been working with teachers i've been teaching um even my dad who's the one of you know the other half of the team he was, was a professional drummer for most of his life too so the team is musicians but with you know a solid tech foundation so that's sort of how we make everything work. And then really we just listen to the teachers and that's now really where the program's going. So everything we add now is mostly just suggestions from, from everyone who's using it. Okay, so um, I know a lot of teachers, including myself, have tried a lot of different platforms from Zoom, as we all know, the famous Zoom to Skype to WhatsApp to, um, what was the other one? Rock Out Loud mm -hmm. and all the, yeah, all these multitude of technology how would yours be different compared to the rest yeah so the big thing about music is different is the audio engine is music specific so you don't have to turn on music mode or any of that kind of stuff it is designed for that um and just runs you know in that capability on every browser every platform every device so it's completely universal and then the other half of music is full practice software lesson management um, it's really something that kind of takes a lot of products that you might use 
you know, you might pay for five different things to achieve what Musi does in one sort of bundle. But we don't do, we don't call ourselves an all-in-one because we don't do things like billing and invoicing and scheduling and that kind of stuff, because really that is a different product. That's, that's sort of, um, you know, sort of aside from our mission, which is helping teachers teach and helping students learn. So that's our focus is the education and sort of the collaboration between the two sides. Um, yeah, yeah, billing in and all that is kind of the admin side of it, isn't it? This is more of yeah. the, the studio kind of thing. Exactly. And it's necessary, you know, but there's tons of great products out there that do that really well and have been well established doing that kind of thing. And we're later this year, we're going to be doing like API plugins to those kinds of products instead of building our own. So that way you can just use whatever billing product you have with Musi. So those kinds so of So it things kind of cool. links links yeah. up rather than separate okay cool now i think the best way of sh of yeah do you want to, do you want to see yes it? let's let's just share it <laughs> yeah. so that, you know, the best way of looking and doing it is um actually trying it out and uh, demonstrating it to everyone perfect so um let me know can you see that screen share absolutely awesome so this is the main uh portal of Musi. once you log in as a teacher so there's a couple things sort of right off the bat that make Musi different, like you said, from a Zoom or Skype or something of that nature. And that is sort of the infrastructure that we provide. So the file and resource is sort of the heart of the system. So whether you're doing in-person lessons, online lessons, hybrid lessons, you can upload literally everything you have into Musi, every video, every file, every piece of music. And then from here, all you have to do is select a student and then just click one of the share toggles, and then that immediately provides access to that student. So if you just select a different student, you can share the resource to them as well. So it's a really effective way for managing everything that you use while you teach. So it gives you pretty much a seamless interaction between you and your students, and it's unlimited file storage, so you're not going to get that annoying, like, hey, you've reached your limit, pay two more dollars. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of tragic crazy. Um, so, does it have to be like in a PDF format or a JPEG or it doesn't really matter? No, no, yeah, anything really. It could be pretty much any file type that um, is displayable on a uh, on a browser. Um, so it's pretty much everything. Um, it's pretty cool because you can do le lesson recordings. You can upload things from your phone. You can record things, you know, through like proper audio workstations and send those in all of that kind of stuff. And then with Musi itself, the platform is really designed so you can create most of the content while you're in the platform. So if you want to record a video, we've got that. If you want to create a worksheet, you can do that. If you want to share files or you know build assignments or any of that, you can do it all right inside the platform. And then of course, bring in anything from the outside that you need. Um, okay, so just looking at this, I know some people may seem overwhelmed because of this with so many on in. But what I, I like to say is that any platform, if it's new, you're going to feel a little bit overwhelmed, but you kind of have to try it and get to know it and understand it in order to use it. And that's absolutely. the same for using Zoom as well, or using, um, you know, um, Skype or something that you've never used before. So don't awesome. get overwhelmed with this. When you look at it, it, it is actually quite fun. And it's just try trying it at your own time. Yeah. Um, however, before we go on, I just want to encourage any teachers out there or any students out there who is um, watching this live. If you do have any questions, please, please, type on on the chat or always or you can always send through a, a private chat a private message to either me or sam we are happy to um you know go through your questions or answers um queries sorry um <laughs> and if you're watching this one recorded the same thing if you've got any questions you are more than welcome to you know send through your questions through absolutely Awesome. So yeah, so that is a really important thing about Musi. So the way this platform is designed is for all teachers, all music teachers. So the way I sort of show it or explain it is, I'll, well, I'll explain all of it and I'll show all of it. But I tell everybody, take what you need and leave what you don't. If you don't need something or you have a really efficient way of doing something already and you don't want to change it, that's okay. You, you don't have to change that. You can leave that part alone and you can see what the other things have to offer. So there's a definitely um, a little bit of a learning curve, but the way we manage all of this is through this help chat in the corner. 
So if you ever click that button, it opens a chat and that chat support is live and it's real people all the time. So no matter what time of day. Real people you, means just Sam, is it? <laughs> pretty, pretty much. It depends what time of day it is. So if it's late, late into the middle of the night, you'll probably catch me. But if it's uh, normal working hours, it'll be someone else. Um, okay. But it's all people on my team. So it's not outsourced or anything. It's not a robot. It's all our team that have it. We all have it on our phone. So if you message us, we'll message you right back. Um, and that's right. how we... And, we and to, through experience, I'm just going to point this out. Through experience, I've always been getting a response almost immediately. So if you need any help, that is a good place to go to. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So it's, it, it is, it's, it's, it's basically text dingoes. So it's a really direct line to, to the team. And we can help you with anything from there. And we've got articles and help documents and uh, long webinars and all that kind of stuff that will dive into it and demos and live you know, sessions, all that kind of stuff. But basically the way that Musi works is you create, a, you, you create an account as a teacher and then you invite all your students onto the platform. So as you can see here, we've got these six different students. Now, when you actually get on, it presents as just a list of students, which is probably a little bit more manageable for most people. But if you want to have some fun, you can switch it to the monsters. And those are just things the students can choose when they create their accounts. Um, so it's just a fun little thing that we have. <laughs> um, but basically, the idea is that everything now for the lessons is all managed through this part of the platform. So for example, if we actually want to start a lesson, we just find the student who's online. So that's this one in the corner. And then we just click start online lesson. And this yeah, will so actually- if, if, if you notice, uh, if you want to go backwards just for a moment, yeah. so we'll probably hang up for a moment. Now, if you notice on the top corner, it's there. It, there's this tab that says play and it says um, start online lesson with student. Yeah. That is different from if the student is offline. So let's say we click on a red student, it's actually yeah. yellow. Yep, and that start in-person lesson. So the way that that's designed is that the assumption is that if a student is in person, like they've literally walked into the room with you, they're not gonna have like a phone or a computer with them. Uh, they're just gonna be at their lesson like normal. So they'll be offline, like they're, you know, they'll be offline. So you just click on that student and hit start in-person lesson. And you actually get the exact same environment as you get for the online lesson. So it's really familiar. It's easy to really easy to kind of transition back and forth. But it lets you record your in-person lessons. It lets you create digital content for students. Even if you're handing out physical paperwork, that's still, you know, good. Do that. That's, you know, you don't want to take away the folders or anything. But this allows you to make sure that there's always a reference copy. There's always something that could be downloaded and printed out. There's always a way of sort of tracking your students' progress and making sure that they're actually working on things. And then for you as a teacher, it's just organized. So it doesn't matter what kind of teaching you're doing. Everything exists inside this portal. So um, would you say this would be good for, let's say we've got a young student and the parents want to know what the, the student's doing in the lesson. Would that yeah. be a good area for the, the parents to watch a, a lesson? Yeah, so the, basically what you can do is um, you could have it recorded so this family could rewatch the lesson. It will have lesson history. It will tell you how long the lesson is, if the teacher makes assignments. And we'll go through all these tools specifically. Um, but the teacher, students, or their parents are able to go back and reference all of the things that happened in the lessons. So it's very transparent across sort of from teacher to students. Um, but it also acts as a hub for any kind of teaching. So it, for the teacher, you don't need to think, okay, this student's online, all of their stuff is in Google Drive. Okay, this person's in person, so their stuff is all over there in that filing cabinet. You can just say, okay, it doesn't actually matter, everything's here in Musi. And then if you want to hand out papers, like I said, you know, that's still definitely good practice. <laughs> I don't want to take that away. Yeah, but, absolutely. Okay, so can... I know, I know, I'm just going to cut you for a moment. I know there's so much there on, on what we see at the moment, and that's going to be taking us more than an hour. So what we're going to be showing is probably let's just touch base, base on the basics. And then yeah. if you all have any questions, um, you know, you can always join. You've got a Facebook page, group page that, um, yeah. that I've seen that has a lot of questions, uh, which, you know, teachers have posted. So that will be where we can go. Because I, I don't want to overwhelm everybody especially yeah. when this is something new. <laughs> yeah, and so we're not we'll going to just... go through everything. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we'll look into the, the exciting features that I've, I've seen. 
and we'll just look into the basics. So then if, if any one of you are you know interested in checking it further, then yeah, join the Musee.live, is it Facebook page? And then I'll put in the link as well at the end of our session. Yeah. Yeah, awesome, okay. yeah. So basically- Okay, the, so the, yes, let's go to the online student thing and see how- Yeah, so that's it. The, the most of the use case is, is the online stuff, right? So you click on your student when they log in and then you just hit start online lesson. And that takes us into sort of the teaching portal. So like most, you know, this is sort of where it becomes sort of zoom light. -like. So you just hit start lesson and then that will fire I've, up the end. I've forgotten to click start lesson before. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you want to make sure you click start. The reason we have it set like that so that you can set up your cameras, microphones, all of the other peripherals and things before you actually join the call. And so this I'm using a dummy student here. So that's why we've got a little monster instead of a real person. Um, but that would be where your student goes um, as far as, you know, the video. Um, but this is just an easy way to show show everything off. Um, but then okay, and there's one thing, um, mm -hmm. the record button. If you want to record a lesson from memory, yes. you have to click the record button before you press the start button. Yeah, so for one-on-one -on -one lessons, that's true. This record option must be clicked before we start the lesson, and that will record the whole entire lesson. And then at the end of the lesson, everything's stored in the cloud, but it will provide access to you and whoever was in the lesson. So everyone immediately can go and rewatch the lessons and access those recordings if you record it. If you're in a group lesson, you can actually start and stop the recording anytime. It's just a weird quirk of how that works, but um, that is uh, definitely something worth mentioning. And that's one of two recording features. So we'll go into the clips in a little bit, but that's one of our other ways of recording the lesson. And that seems to have become a little bit more popular. So I'll sort of explain why too. But basically the way that you, you know, most of it is this, you're teaching your lesson, you've got you and your student and you can change your layouts so you can set up sort of whatever you, you know, feel comfortable with. Um, so that's, you know, whatever personal preference you like. And then from here, you have all the typical things, you know, screen sharing, audio, video setups, uh, multiple cameras, switching cameras, all the kind of generic things. So that's all in there. But the fun stuff is over under the tools. So when we open tools, this pulls a lot of the stuff from the teacher portal into the lesson. So we have our files, we have our chat, whiteboard, assignments, and clips. And so these are sort of the main things of Musee. So as I was saying with the files, this is sort of the heart of the system because as a teacher, you can upload literally everything you use into here. And then as you're teaching, all you need to do is just click share and that student immediately has access. Then when you open that resource, the student will see that on their side too. So if we share this and we open this folder and we find a game, um, this will immediately share to the student when we open the game. So the student is seeing the same thing that the teacher is seeing. So it, it makes it really simple for the students. They can basically sit back and just sort of watch what's happening. And then when it comes to actually having interactive uh, parts of the lesson, we've got tons of different tools for that. So this would be one of the games. It looks like my computer's running pretty slowly today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this is it. So that would show up for you and your student. It could be a PDF. It could be a video. It could be anything that you need to use for teaching. And it's just there right in the lesson for you. And like I said, unlimited file storage. And then the file manager itself is basically a clone of Google Drive. So if you're familiar with how Google Drive works, then you can use this very simply. Uh, the chat feature is a pretty straightforward thing, you know, is chatting back and forth with your student. The thing that makes this a little different is that the history of the chat will never delete. So everything you say back and forth to your student is always here. So it's a nice reference point your students can always refer back to or you can refer back to. It also sort of proves that you've said things and that your students can't pretend that they didn't see it or <laughs> working on it. It's a little bit of the accountability system there. Uh, so they, they can't hide from you as much with, with Musee in play. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Um, let's say you're currently teaching at a moment and then you've mm -hmm. got uh, another student that's waiting on you mm -hmm. would you be able to see that chat while still teaching on a previous student so you wouldn't see their chats but we do have this attendees list and this actually lets you see all the students that are actively online so if you're going back to back with lessons and you know you're kind of running up to the last few minutes you can check to see if the student is online and ready to go 
And that way you sort of know that you need to wrap up the lesson and continue on. Um, if they're not online, then, you know, you probably have a couple more minutes to sort of figure it out. Yeah. So the, the reason why I ask is occasionally we tend to be so engrossed with teaching that we, you know, lose track of time. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, a little ping would, would, would remind us is like, oh, it's, it's time for the next lesson. So that was what, that was why I was wondering, because I, I think I've, there was a couple of times I've seen students um, writing in the chat, but I didn't see the chat until later on, where it's like, Miss, I'm already waiting in the room. <laughs> yeah, you can set everything to notifications. So there's sort of two different ways for that. So you can either get everything to go to your phone so that you can just get a text message like they're just basically texting you. Um, and that would that would sort of work for that situation. Or you can get the notifications right in your desktop that kind of slide out from the side and will tell you what the person's saying. Um, so those are sort of workarounds for that. Having the full messaging system inside the lesson itself can get kind of confusing because students could just be messaging you about homework or assignments or anything that they might be working on. And it would just be pinging through while you're trying to teach someone <laughs> else. So there's All always right, so, a fine So power. how do we set the notification? Uh, so to, I, when you uh, yeah, on that other page, like when we're outside the lesson, yeah. there's a whole uh, profile set up. And so it's pretty typical stuff like, you know, your email, your phone number, all that kind of stuff. And then you'll have SMS notifications, desktop notifications, um, and then a couple of different other things. OK, cool. Now, I, I used to, uh, you know, sh show or um, introduce like student teaching platforms. And mm -hmm. the one question that always comes to me is about piano teachers, where Piano teachers want to have a camera facing the paddles as well as on the top and through the side. And that's the beautiful thing about music is that you can set all that up without, um, you know, distorting something one way or another. Yeah, let me see if I have my second camera plugged in. There we go. There we go. Hello. And then if I do <laughs> this, I can reset the... So this would be like a second camera layout. You actually have this custom layout feature too, which is pretty cool. So you can actually just create your own layout and set the windows however you feel like it. Um, so it's pretty easy to use too. So that's sort of a personal thing. If you want to go crazy with that, have fun with it. Yeah. But personally, I usually just use grid mode. It's nice and easy. Everything's in the same position at that point. Um, but yeah, multicam is built right in. There's also, if you use OBS or any kind of software that has all the fancy add-ons, that's all compatible. It's compatible with any kind of external gear, uh, interfaces, microphones, MIDI instruments, which we'll get into. Um, but that's all, yeah, it works with any kind of you know external materials. Yeah, and if you notice the sound is not distorted because it, you, you know sometimes when you have multiple cameras, it catches all the yeah. extra sounds. Yeah, we have a yeah, special system basically. So the second camera won't pick up the audio from the first. Um, but yeah, it's and like I said, everything is designed for music. So it's designed with the intent that that camera is going to be pointed at the bass pedal of a drum set or the pedal of a piano or really close to the hands of a guitar player or something. So, you know, the, a, lot, a lot of the things that go into normal traditional conferencing platforms, we have all that stuff, but with a slight little tweak, because there's, act, you know, with music, it is ever so slightly different. Um, mm, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. on the top, what the best function or feature or one of the great feature is that um, I emoji you on the top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew you were going to say that. Yep. So this is our, this is the famous tool. Uh, this is, everyone loves this thing. It's, I love it. It's great. It's, it fires off emojis. Um, the fist bumps was my student. He personally requested that one. So but we have pretty much anything you know you can think of. It's, it's fun. Anytime your student does something well, you can just fire it off. I made the mistake of telling my students that it was automated and that it always goes off when they do things really well. Don't tell them that because then you're just sitting there clicking it all day. <laughs> and so, um, but it is it's a lot of fun. There's And we have a whole system like these monsters, as you saw, that's sort of the band that shoots out. These are part of the assignments and the practice side of the system. So for the students, they can go in at any time. They can access their homework, their uh, lesson recordings, uh, assignments, anything of that nature. And when they're practicing, they're sort of uh, adding up time on the leaderboard and that gets them badges and awards. And then you can send them different stickers. And we've got like 20 different band members that they just kind of like Pokemon. They're trying to collect all of the band 
So, yeah. you know, we've got a little bit of gamification. Uh, none of that's actually in the lesson besides this emoji button because uh, it can get pretty distracting. So that's all on sort of the, we call there's sort of the teacher portal, which is the area we were before, and then sort of the lesson portal, which is this. Um, Absolutely. So sort of now, if you notice on the top, guys, um, you can control this so you students don't go crazy trying to figure out where it is for them to consistently click on it. Yes. So that purple tab thing, I think, for memory yeah. is where you, um, yeah. Yeah, on and off. yeah, so you can, this allows you to control everything. So usually it's on. And then when it's on, you have full control over the system. The, when there's interactive tools. So like if we go into here and we look at the whiteboard, um, the this is fully interactive between the student and the teacher. So with our whiteboard, this is a pretty neat feature because it goes kind of in depth. So if you're teaching private lessons, I recommend just picking a private whiteboard. But if you're teaching group lessons, there's the choice becomes prevalent. So if you want everybody in the group to have their own personal board, then you choose private and everyone just gets their own board. And then the teacher has a filter and they can just go back and forth between all the different boards and work with each student individually. Or if you want a public board, everyone in the group has one board and they all collaborate on that together. So that's sort of the major difference there, but it does allow for really flexible styles of teaching. So if you're doing like a, a group class and everyone's of different levels, they can all have their own content and it's really easy to manage right on screen. It's kind of like it, we try to mimic everything off real life too. So if you think of like handing out a paper to someone, right, and or you hand out the same paper to everyone, you know, it's either individualized or a group thing. So we try to kind of uh, keep that mentality across the platform. And there's quite a few features of the platform that work in that sort of way. But the whiteboard is probably one of the coolest things we have. This is uh, probably the most popular feature. The idea is that you have everything you need sort of at your fingertips. We have all these different templates for you. So depending on what you teach, you can just quickly grab a, you know, the paper and start working. Or if you have something of your own, some sheet music, a game, anything of that nature, you can just bring that into the platform. You can either upload it directly off your computer or you can just grab it from your file manager. So I have this old game. So <laughs> I'll, I'll get one that's more interesting. That's like the last page. Um, St. Patrick's Day specials. Let's do this one. Perfect. So I can open the game and now this is the game on the board. So student sees all this in real time. And then we can play the game. So if, uh, and the student has full access to these tools. So they're seeing the same interface. So if they want to grab, uh, what would be the answer? Is that a dotted half note, I think? So you can grab a dotted half note and then you can just bring it over here and add it into the game. So we try to have every element that you're probably going to need just kind of at your fingertips. So you can either play games, you can bring in worksheets, you can annotate scores anything of that nature. Um, you can clear the whiteboard. So you have, um, you can restart, you can make as many whiteboards throughout the lesson as you need. Everything auto saves. So as you're working on this with your student, it's just saving constantly. And then what's really neat about this is when the student goes home, if you say you gave them a worksheet, they can go home, log into Musi, and they can actually draw on the worksheet at any time. So they have access to sort of fill in things. They can, of course, print everything off and do it by hand. But if they've got like a tablet or something, it's pretty easy to sort of make digital homework and things from that. So mm. it was, you know, a neat use case for it. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So it's like for me, it's going to take time to work or actually try this out um, mm. just to kind of, you know, getting used to where everything is laid yeah. out and things like that. So, you know, if you have time, you, it, it, I would encourage to actually try and go through that uh, as much yeah. as you can. Now, um, I think the question asked is, um, like, especially for Australia, we're, we're so mm -hmm. far away, right? And depends on the student's connection in itself. Now, from experience with my students, on the top, there is a button called Refresh, A-V. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed sure. there, there, are such, there are times where I can see the students, but the students can't see me. So what I've done is I've clicked on the refresh AV and um, that kind of resets and um, yeah, pushes or nudges, like like what I would say, <laughs> the connection between the two systems. 
Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's sort of the saving grace button. Uh, whenever anything goes wrong, if you go out of sync with your audio and video, if something becomes stuttery, if somebody can't see or can't hear somebody else, uh, both sides have that button and you just click it and it turns off and turns on your video and audio and it completely resets the connection. So most of the time that fixes 90% of problems that people run into. The connection, it depends, uh, of course, on Wi-Fi and things like that do have a big impact on the top quality that you'll be able to achieve. But the nice thing about this kind of thing is the base level quality is much higher than what you're going to get on something like Zoom. So if, even if you don't have fancy Wi-Fi or a fancy device, which we assume most students don't have because they don't. And, you know, it's not expected that people are going to go out and buy a brand new MacBook Pro with a you know, 5G router and all this extra stuff. It's just not really fair. So, you know, we build the program with the assumption that you just have whatever you have, a phone, a laptop, a Chromebook from school, you know, and that's sort of designed in that mind. That's why it's a web-based program. So it's all just, you log in from, you know, any browser and then you have access to the, the tools and everything you need. So if you need to jump from different devices each week, that's no problem. Uh, and then, like I said earlier, it works on every kind of device. Okay, I'm yet to try the group setting. I'm, I'm really excited to try it out actually. Um, the question that people, I know people will be asking is, would it be possible to play or use it in an ensemble se se session or let's say jamming session? Sort of. So the final thing is still Wi-Fi. So if, if everybody's on, you know, uh, ethernet and you're, uh, relatively close to each other, you can actually get pretty incredible results. We have some clips on our Facebook page of teachers singing and playing with their students pretty much perfectly. The thing though, I never claim that you can do perfect duets because the internet doesn't allow that. That just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so the issue is that it, it, someone will definitely not have good enough Wi-Fi to make it work. So if that, and that the, every group relies on sort of the weakest link. So that person would be holding back that ability. There are workarounds though. So with Musi, we have this really neat feature clips and this is how you use it for ensembles. So the idea here is that you can go in and record anything that you need. Similarly, public and private, just like the whiteboard, same exact options. But the way it works is you can just log in here and you can record something. And this immediately will get transferred to the students who then can record themselves and then add that to the composition. So it sort of negates the need to worry about lag or Wi-Fi or anything like that. So if you wanna do a duet or you wanna play a song, you play your part, you just hit record and you're know, one, two, three, four, you know, and then you start playing your thing. And then when you're done, hit stop and then save recording. And then in a couple of seconds, that will be down there. And that is now seen by everybody in the group. So they can then add their recordings to it. So if they want, they can just mute themselves. So you know, you're not hearing everyone else and then just hit record and you can record your part. So, so you'd be like one, one two, two, three, four, three, five, four. and then you hit save and it'll just add it to the composition. And you can do this over and over and over again. So the cool thing is that you don't have to worry about buying fancy routers or anything. You just record everything and you're doing this all in real time while you're teaching in the lesson. The nice thing is it helps the students learn a little bit about how to record, how to use a metronome, all that kind of basic things but also provides you with real duets. So those two tracks now, when I hit play, they'll play back together. So that is because every time I record, they're just synchronized to the first recording. So it's a really cool way of making an orchestral ensemble or a choir or a four-part harmony or even just for homework. So you could come in here and just record something like a 12-bar blues. And then your student, for homework could be practice until they feel comfortable recording a solo. And then when they're ready, they just hit record and they can record their solo and it will just attach to the, the file and they can just sit there and listen back to it. And you know, you guys can critique it in the lesson and everything like that. And this works in groups. And as I mentioned with public and private, so you can either make a group ensemble where everybody's playing together and you're all signing, patching it into one, or with private, everyone is just working with the teacher independently. So if the teacher records something, each student's recordings will not be seen by the other students. 
So that way you can have very privatized sort of education, even when you're inside of a group. Um, but yeah, yeah. of course, you to record parts of the lesson. It doesn't actually have to be a duet or anything. It's, yeah. yeah, no, that's amazing. So, you know, um, yeah, I can, I can just imagine my students going crazy with this, actually, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's fun. <laughs> It is. And it's like, it's like in social media, how people do duets and things like that, yep. like TikTok and stuff like that. Um, you know, this looks like the exact same function of how it would be. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's, it's all, a... All, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's all downloadable. So like we actually have seen teachers use these for things like TikToks and YouTube videos and stuff like that. So you can download it and your whole ensemble could just be thrown up on YouTube and you, know, you could do whatever you want with it from there. The cool thing too, actually, one neat side effect we've seen uh, with clips is that because the recording is only the teacher or only the student or whoever is recording, it's just them, you can record as you go just parts of your lessons. And we've seen teachers do this for maybe two or three months and then take all of those recordings and turn them into a course so that they have like a pre-recorded course from all of the lesson content. And because the students aren't in the recordings, it just looks like the teacher is just talking to the camera. And it's much more natural because you're actually talking to a student. So you don't have the awkward talking to the camera <laughs> thing. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's a neat side effect I didn't really plan on, but is I've seen a lot of people sort of take advantage of. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be that would be good for me to use, actually, because I do a lot of um, recording and teaching kind of thing. So yeah. that would be amazing. Okay, so can we get out of this one and then we'll, uh, just show everyone the um, achievement board? Yeah. So, um, so that's going to be all outside the lessons. So, mm. oh, let me just save that and close it. Um, here, before we jump to that real quick, I just want to show the assignments for a second, because this is a culmination of everything. So the idea with your assignments is that you can go in and name the assignment, and then you can write up the instructions, and then you just add any relevant your material that that student should work on. And then this is an important part of the achievement stuff, because if the student has an assignment, as soon as they open the assignment, it will start tracking their practice and it will tell you how many times they've opened the assignment and how much time they're spending in the assignment. So, so would go, this be like writing and writing the student's notes, like what you have to do for the week? A little bit, yeah. So if I go in and look at like this assignment, it says, hello, please use the metronome. This is your homework, work on scales, chords. And then they have all of these things that they need to work on. And so this, and so it's all actionable. So if you add like a whiteboard or you add a clip, the student can go in here and record themselves along with the clip, or they can edit the whiteboard, or they can just practice along. So they might have this piece of paper or whatever the games, and they can go in and they can look at multiple resources at the same time. So they might have a piece of music and like the audio from the music and, or a video of you playing it or whatever it might be. So they can set that up however they'd like to. And then this uh, is where it sort of tracks their progress. So you'll see the different amount of uh, sessions they practice, the amount of time they practice, uh, any notes the students have made, or any files or any recordings the students have uploaded will all populate in this window. So that can be viewed any time by the teacher. Um, and then so that ties directly into the leaderboards and everything. So if we leave the lesson environment, this is one of the really fun you know, it's become very popular. There's like 30,000 practice sessions this year or something already. Um, it's crazy. People go nuts for this. So um, the neat thing here is as your students practice, they'll immediately populate onto the leaderboard and you'll see exactly where they're standing. So this student has done 27 minutes and overall this year, they're sort of standing at the top of the leaderboard. Down at the bottom, you'll see all of the awards they've won. So I think if we click on Ray, so this person has actually won stuff. So they have, um, you know, they've come in third, first place three times, second place, first place for the month, second place for the month, and first place for the whole year. So that's so all is that? Oh, oh, yeah. No, you just yeah. answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's all automated. You don't need to worry about assigning this or anything. It's just based on the student's practice time. Now, there is one glaring obvious flaw that everyone will jump right to is, well, wouldn't my student just hit record or hit practice and then just walk away? And ironically, no, we've actually found that most of the time we get chat messages through support from kids who will say things like, 
hey, I accidentally left my timer running and it says three hours, but I actually only did 45 minutes. Can you guys fix that? And I, for a while, I couldn't really figure it out. But then uh, I was out for a run and then I forgot to turn off my watch and I got in the car and drove home. And so my run was like 17 miles and at like 60 miles an hour or whatever. And I was like, well, now my data's all messed up. So I wanted to delete the, you know, the wrong part of the data because it's actually pretty cool to see over the time how much you've actually practiced. And this is going to, it stays forever. So if your students are on here for, you know, we've had students on here for three years, they'll have three years worth of practice data that they can go back and check on, um, which is re really cool to see. Um, but the monsters are not automated. So this is the one side of the practice stuff the teacher sort of gets involved in. And the reason is that when you send a monster, you can actually write a personal message on it. So you can, you know, say something to the student, sort of award them for, for doing well. Um, you know, so it could be whatever you want. Um, can you resend a monster? Yeah. So you, so if you run out of monsters, you can go back through and you can write new messages. And so when the student looks at it, they'll see similarly to these, like the times three, they'll see that as well on the monsters. And then when they click on the monster, they'll see all three messages as well. So, and like timestamps of, of when it all was sent to you and everything. So yeah, you can sort of recycle the monsters. We add more pretty constantly, um, but it's, I've almost run out of instruments. I'm, I'm not, now I've got to get cr creative. So, <laughs> so where, yeah, where is the, oh, you got a violin. You've got the yeah, there's, um, violins up here. We've got oboe or clarinet, I guess. We could probably start getting more specific and do like, <laughs> uh, you know, like alto sax versus tennis sax. And you know, with the tuba. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great one. A tuba is a good idea. Um, actually, that's a good point. There's probably a whole bunch we could, we've still got room for, but it is a lot of fun. It's one of those things. It's a little bit of gamification, but it's not over the top or anything. So it's not the main focus of the platform at all, but it is there to sort of add the little bit of motivation for students who, you know, engage in this kind of thing. Um, and it does really seem to work um, as far as our data tells us. I would encourage teachers to explain a little bit about this to parents because I do know that parents can be quite skeptical about this kind of stuff um, and the thing is there are some parents that like to control screen time so if you explain how the practice side of it works and then we can you know just tell them that we can test it out to see and monitor yeah. how their practices are at least the parents also know that you leave notes so they know what they're supposed to be practicing on as well. Exactly. Yeah. Screen time is a big one. We hear that quite often. And fortunately, it never actually becomes a problem because I think it's pretty straightforward, as, as we all know, it's for educational use. So obviously, you know, most parents sort of break that apart from just playing games and things. And that's why we don't go too far into the gamification stuff, because we don't want it to look like the kids are just logging in and like, making an avatar and changing the hats and not actually doing anything that has to do with practicing. So there's, that will sort of always be limited. You know, we'll, we'll add stuff to keep it fun, but um, it's definitely not a game in that sense. Uh, and that's kind of on purpose. So, but yeah, the screen time thing and just technology in general, I recommend, you know, the uh, teachers and if they, you're not sure about it yourself, you can obviously, you know, talk to, you know, people like me and Lorraine, that can kind of give you an idea of what is, you know, usable, accessible, what you should and shouldn't do and stuff like that. But, you know, at Musi, that's pretty much what we do most of the time is train teachers to sort of effectively communicate this to the families and see, you know, it seems to have a pretty good result as, as far as them using it. Mm, absolutely. Now, I, I just want to touch base in regards to um, sending through the link and all that information. Um, if you want to go through that very quickly on the left hand corner of the your tab. So setting up so like the invite stuff and hmm. uh, so with Musi, this is one thing that's quite different from something like Zoom is you don't use meeting links. So instead of so with like Zoom, you know, you just send them the meeting link or the ID and they just grab that and then log in or or just connect with you. Musi, the student does need to log into their own account. That's how we do all the file sharing, all the interactive tools, how everything is saved. And that's really what it's for is just so your students can access it from any device and not have to worry about downloading and uploading and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but the way it works is you just go into invite. And actually, when you first get to Musi, you go to this getting started page and it will walk you through everything you need to know as far as, you know, how to get through the program. And there's all the help guides and all that stuff. But you can even just click invite students. And then from here, you just click add. And then you just punch in the email addresses for anyone, um, you know, that you want to invite. So we'll just do Bob at Musi. And then, you know, you could copy a whole CSV file or whatever you have, you can just put it in there. And then you just hit next and you choose which um, email provider you use. If you use Google and Yahoo, um, then it can sort of automate this for you. So for me, I use Google. So if I click on that, can you still see that? No. <laughs> I figured that would happen because it brings that, it pulls me to another sure. page. Yeah, so that's it, fine. Okay, so what, what happens that I've experienced is um, parents going, oh, we haven't received anything. Tell them to check the junk mail. Well, it, the, it, sh it comes from your email address. So it should be, it's like you sending them an email. So they should, if it goes to spam or anything, definitely make sure they know. But um, the email provide is sent from your domain. So it should usually land in the inbox. The thing that can be confusing is if they don't know that you're changing the system or they have no idea that this is coming, then they're not looking for it. So that can kind of be catching people off guard. So I would recommend letting everyone know that yeah. you're going to invite them to something before you just cold invite everyone because um, yeah. that can get very confusing, definitely. Yeah, so what I'll do is I will send a text message to go, you know, I've just sent you a link. Let yeah. me know if you received it. If they haven't and they insist that they haven't, just tell them to kindly tell them to check their junk mail because sometimes it's there. If not, you know, you can always send it again or maybe send it to a different email address. Yeah, and you have this built-in resend function. So you can just hit resend invite and it'll just send it again. So if they ever, you know, if they don't see it. Now the invites are technically optional. So it's something that we is, you know, if you use our tool, it's much more organized and you'll be able to keep like this shows us who has signed up and who hasn't signed up. So we know, so we can kind of keep a list. But if you just want to text your students and sort of tell them, hey, we're using Musi, go to the website, create an account. Um, as long as they know your teacher code, that's the one unique thing that Musi does is every teacher makes a teacher code. And you can see here, so this one's like my code. So it can be whatever you want. And then the student just uses that code when they're signing up. So it's sort of like that's like their meeting link. They use that code one time when they create their account, and then they never have to worry about connecting with you again. Every time they log into their account, they're just already connected to you. So that's how you're able to always share files or do anything uh, when the students are offline. Um, and that's sort of the whole basis of having the accounts. And then a couple of you know things that are pretty neat about Musi that um, is sort of uh, also just fun is in a lesson, you have the MIDI capabilities. So if you're teaching anything um, that could use this, sing it, you know, it's quite a lot uh, that, that where it's relevant, but we have piano, but we also have guitar and we also have violin. So the don't kill me for the MIDI sounds, I'm sorry, they are just <laughs> cheap MIDI sounds. So I'm aware they sound terrible. We are looking at much, much prettier ones. Um, but the idea is that you can you know, change the sound violin. Um, no, so I can hear that, but. <laughs> right, yeah, it probably won't come through because I don't think I'm sharing the audio. Yeah. Um, but anything you play will play for you and the student in real time. You also have this transcription tool so that anything you do will just pop up on screen instantly. So it's a great way of making worksheets and reference guides or anything that you need for your students. Um, and then if you have a MIDI device, like I just use these little like MIDI keyboards or that guitar has a MIDI pickup, um, you can just, anything you play will be, you know, it'll, it'll work too. And it works with full size MIDI devices or anything of that nature. So, um, Okay, so um, I'm going to throw this question out because I'm a multi-instrumentalist uh, uh, and I teach the woodwind and all the strings and vocal yeah. and stuff like that. Now, in regards to the volume of the instrument of your student teach when you're teaching your students, because um, like, let's say the saxophone is going to be louder than the violin, like how, how can we control that whole volume system? Yeah, so there's, you, there's no 
tools in Musi for that. It's all automated. So everything internally is basically catching volume, making sure it doesn't overblow. I mean, if you yell into the microphone or you get your saxophone right up to the mic and just blast it, it you'll, you will overload the, the, the thing. There's nothing you can really do about that. Um, one thing that is important to know is with anything like this, Zoom, Musi, whatever it is you're using, we can only do so much with the signal that you provide us. So you have to give us the best quality signal to work with. So if you have the ability to use an external microphone, definitely do so. It will definitely enhance the quality of the lesson um, and it's well worth the investment. Most of them really aren't that expensive. Students, on the other hand, like I said, we don't expect anyone to go out and buy anything. So there are, you know, the, the simple tricks, of course, like just making sure they're not pointing the saxophone directly at the microphone and they're a little offset, things like that. But the system should just take care of all of that for you. There's no real settings as far as, like I said, music mode or anything like that. It just is, is pretty aware. Um, but yeah, so it should just handle it. Okay, and um, let's say we're comparing like a, a piccolo um, mm -hmm. or a violin on the high notes, like on mm -hmm. an E string. How does the system uh, control the, that? Because like for me, I, what I'm noticing is uh, when I teach my violin lessons is with the lower strings, it's fine. But the moment they start playing all the high notes on the E string, uh, on, on the highest string, it's when sometimes it gets a little bit piercing. Yeah, high notes are much more complicated because uh, you have to, it, re it bleeds into feedback territory. So it uses an intelligent system that's just always going back and forth between is that a note or is that feedback? And so it can, some instruments can actually hit the same frequencies that feedback is. And then you are kind of stuck in this until there's, you know, really sophisticated AI that can, you know, pick out exactly what's what, then you are still stuck to frequency referencing. Um, but the way that, like I said, with everything being automated, it's designed to take the full spectrum of pretty much most instruments. We have a lot of bagpipe teachers, which is kind of cool. Um, and that seems to work really well. And that's obviously a lot of really high pitched um, notes. And we have a lot of tin whistle teachers too. So the system, I think, is getting quite used to that kind of stuff. Where it usually has the hardest time is when you jump from low to high really quickly. Yes. That's, that's usually just everything trying to catch up with itself. And, and that's something that's just continuously optimizable as more and faster computers, better technology, you know, better code. Those are the kinds of things that we sort of just pick at constantly. Um, but yeah, there's no real one way to do it. It's sort of amalgamation of like 50 different things that make that work. Yeah, no, okay, cool. No, thanks for the explanation because I, I have noticed that and it's it's different from when you have the, what do you say, the tin whistle and it's the cons yeah. constant high pitch comparatively to playing a low note and then it's suddenly going all the way up. Yeah, that high yeah that's exactly yeah that's where they struggle the most and it's also you know the like i said the quality you get through the microphone as long as that is good you have the best shot of doing it but the faster you play and the more sort of um you know high to low and exaggerated it becomes the harder the system you know has to work but the cool thing about this is we also use something that it's called full duplex audio, but that's really just a fancy name of saying everyone gets their own audio channel. So when you play something or I play something on a lot of things like Zoom, you, you'll see like the clashing where if you talk and I talk, then if someone gets muted or something cuts out. Musi doesn't do that because it uses just a completely different system, but it's because it's designed assuming that you're going to be playing something or talking and someone's going to be playing and talking. And so that uh, we don't, you know, it's technically duets, but again, the lag is the thing that will stop you there. But you can do so really neat. Could, could I potentially have a meeting here instead of Zoom? Oh, totally. Yeah. I, we use, I mean, we use it for all our, our, like all the company stuff. We use it for every meeting we do. Um, so, yeah, we, and we have people that use it for a whole bunch of random things too. Like bands use it. Um, we have t art teachers who have used it. Um, but you can use it really, I mean, it's a conferencing platform at the end of the day, it's just got a much, much higher fidelity system than, than zoom. So you kind of just benefit from a, a good quality conversation. Um, but yes, yeah, it, it, it will work with anything. So it's, it's pretty fun like that.
It is, it is. Man, we could go on and on, isn't it? There's so much on it. Yeah, there's a lot. But that's why we recommend the chat support is the we don't expect everyone to dive into every feature. You know, like we we're saying, there's even um, the settings. So you're asking about no notifications. So like you can go uh, in and a whole bunch of different pages of settings. I'm not going to go through what these do. No, um, I'm just going to tell you that they're there. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, you know, and even these pages, there's data and tools and things that you have. Uh, you can make announcements to your whole studio. There's a lot of stuff. Like I said, take what you need and leave what you don't and slowly adapt to what you're going to use. I always recommend files and whiteboard. Those are my two that if you can use those really well, then you've got 90% of music under your belt. Because in a real lesson, for, I mean, even for me personally, when I'm teaching, I, I will fire up my lesson and I will literally immediately go right from here into the tools and then straight into the, the whiteboard. And usually I'm opening something that we worked on last week and just continuing from there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, 90% of my lesson time is here. And then I'll jump into the assignments, write up some quick notes. And then if I need to record anything, I've got it right there for the, for the student. And then I just put it all into the assignment at the end of the lesson, and then we leave. And the nice thing about music too, is you can do back-to-back -back lessons, no problem. So, you know, if you end on the hour, you can start on the hour. Um, it's, you know, pretty seamless in that nature. Yeah. And then to improve a lesson quality, like what I've to told like a couple of students is I, I've asked them the question. I'm like, how many devices are actually turned on while you're doing your lesson? Yeah. And they go, oh, my iPad, we're actually streaming in a moment. My dad's computer, my mom's computer. So I've, I have told my students to kind of shut down if those devices if they're not using it only we, because we're trying to maximize their lesson. Um, yes. And but having said that, it, it's not deterring the uh, sound quality of the lesson. So it, you just have to try it out to see what's yeah. happening. But it's it's trying to maximize, uh, you know, your lesson, the experience of having your lesson. Anyway, okay. yeah, so, yeah, definitely. yeah. If, even if you ever have the opportunity to like upgrade your Wi-Fi, if it's something you've been on the fence about and you're going to be doing a lot of online teaching, do it. It's definitely worth the investment. You know, like if you're not sure about buying the microphone, but you're going to be teaching online, I would probably make the investment. You know, as the teacher, you're, you know, it's your professional business at the end of the day. So you want to make sure you have the right gear for what you're doing. And, and like you're saying, you know, don't get too overwhelmed with it. And, you know, obviously ask for help when needed, but um, there's a lot you can do. So, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So thank you, Sam. Like I said, we could go on and on and it would be like hours and hours. It's a lot of amazing things out there. Um, but yeah, thanks for sharing. I, I love all the features like in regards to, you know, especially the, the emoji. I know, you know, some teachers have loved that from other platforms as well. And the, the beauty about um, this one is the support. And that's mm -hmm. always what teachers like. Teachers yeah. like to have the support because, you know, sometimes we kind of start freaking out if things don't work the way that we want it to be. So it's good that your, your support system is very quickly um, from experience. So I'm just sharing out there that it's not, I'm not just saying it because I'm saying it, but I've actually experienced of uh, how Sam has helped me as well. And um, yeah, you just got to try in order to see how it goes really. Yeah, definitely. And everyone gets a two week free trial, you know, when you sign up and you can play around with everything. And like I said, you know, take demo with me. I'll personally show you how the whole thing works and make sure, you know, works for your studio and how you teach. You know, the, this is sort of the general demo of everything. But, you know, like I said, you want to usually we hone in on specifically what would work for your style of teaching. So, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And the the we have a Musi teachers group. So it's just called Musi teachers on Facebook. That's where we do sort of hang out, post new things we're working on. Uh, we're about to release an AI in Musi as well. So that's going to come out in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be pretty game changing for how lessons are actually taught so it should be pretty fun yeah absolutely okay so sam what you're going to do is you're going to be sending me all the links to your websites and all this and what yeah. i will do is i will post them up uh when we end our sessions so again if you have any questions please do reach out don't be afraid to reach out uh we're not going to be you know um killing you with a knife and stuff <laughs> for all the questions that you can come through there's no question that's a silly question every oh. question has its um you know perks and it will help you in in, in a sense absolutely. All right. Any advice, Sam, before we end? I think my advice always is just take it easy. Go, you know, start small, 
work your way into things. If you're looking at a new program software, or if you're like a new teaching methodology or new mm -hmm. instrument, and like anything, just baby steps into it. And then once you're comfortable, run with it. So, you know, don't get overwhelmed. Everything's there to help you. Not, not, you know, not absolutely. Yeah. So you see the difference between when COVID started to now is um, when COVID hit was, you know, uh, everyone's trying to push and force into creating something for us where yes. this has been all set up and it's already well developed in a sense but it's always you know it's always going to be improving as you know how technology oh, totally. is so you know give it a try like i said you have to give it a try in order to know if it works for you but um i, I love the multiple videos and how you can do group settings much more fluently and the fact that like you said about Zoom, where it, the conversation doesn't cut off, even though you yes. know there's lacking in, in, in regards to communication. So that's brilliant.